Let's continue our study in the New Testament book of Galatians. If you want to be opening your Bibles to chapter 3, that's where we're going to be. In particular, we'll be covering verses 15 through the end of the chapter, there at verse 25. Um, if you've been with us through the previous studies, you know that chapters 3 and 4 here are the meat of Paul's doctrinal argument against the, those who are coming into Galatia and trying to add elements of the law to God's system of justification by faith. As he's built up to this point, we know Paul has been adamant about not giving in to these troublemakers. And in chapters 3 and 4, he's, he's dealing here with uh, various arguments to make, to make his case. Paul's strong about the doctrine of justification by faith. He's going to continue that here in verses 15 through 25 continuing his scriptural defense, and you know, re recall that uh, verses 1 through 5, Paul argued from their personal experience, had them think back in their lives to their conversion and how things played out, and and if they were thinking carefully about that, they understood that, uh, yes, it was by faith. Everything they did and initially and what they continued to do was by faith in God. Then starting in verse 6 last week, when we went through verse 14, uh, was part of the scriptural argument. After that personal discussion, Paul turns to the scriptures of their day, the old covenant scriptures, and he's going to show that even there, uh, God's plan all along is to, been, to be justify people by faith. He used the example of Abraham in verses three or six, chapter three, verses six through nine, first part of our lesson last week. Uh, Abraham, of course, was. The, the great father of the faithful, a, a revered figure in, in Judaism among the Israelites. And he went back to the scriptures to prove that Abraham was justified by faith. So at the very beginning, uh, it's been that way. He's also shown that the law bring, brought a curse instead of righteousness. That was verses 10 through 14. So the law wasn't designed to justify anyone. We'll see more of that today as well. In fact, he emphasizes there and he proves it by scripture that uh, the law brought a curse instead of making anyone right before God. Now, in particular, we're going to look at verses 15 through 18 of Galatians 3. He's going to contrast the law with the promise to Abraham. And maybe Paul here is anticipating an objection to his use of Abraham to make his case. Perhaps some among Paul's hearers would say, well, yes, Abraham was justified by faith. I'll give you that. But the giving of the law changed things, adding things to the way someone is made righteous. So it's like you had the promise to Abraham and along comes the law and adds things in. In response here, Paul's going to show the priority of the promise to Abraham over the law. That's verses 15 through 18. And then starting in verse 19 through 22, He's going to discuss the real purpose of the law. Yes, the law was important, but not for the way that some of the Judaizing teachers were trying to make it. All right, let's look starting in verse 15. It says, Brethren, I speak in terms of human relations. Even though it is only a man's covenant, yet when it has been ratified, no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. By the way, I'm using the new American, updated New American Standard Version. So Paul here uses an everyday example to illustrate the relationship between the promise to Abraham and the Mosaic law. There was a relationship. Again, it wasn't what they were trying to do with it. Even human covenants or agreements, once ratified, cannot be set aside or altered. To do so would be to violate the terms agreed upon by the parties to the covenant. So Paul says, you know, it's, it works this way even among uh just human relations, right? Imagine, you know, uh, signing a contract perhaps to buy a house or a car and you sit down with the seller and you agreed to the terms of all of that and everybody signed their names and so everything's good, but along came someone else maybe a month later and says, well, you know what, we need to add something else to this agreement. No one would stand for that, right? You, you set the terms and that's what it's going to be. No one's going to come along and set it aside or add conditions to it. 
And the Paul's point here in verse 15 is if that's the case with human covenants, if, you know, humans, if you will, are smart enough to, to handle things that way, how much more so a covenant established and ratified by God himself, as in the case of his covenant with Abraham. So God, you know, you know if we're smart enough to say, well, you know, we've set the terms of a covenant between each other, and we're not going to let somebody play fast and loose with that, then certainly God is not going to handle things that way. Verse 16, Galatians 3. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one, and to your seed, that is, Christ. Of course, human covenants here are not the primary focus. Verse 15, he just used that as, as an example to make his case, but he's talking about more important things here. The covenant or promise that Paul is concerned with here is the one that God made with Abraham. That's the one we're dealing with in context. The covenant promises were made not only to Abraham, but it says here in verse 16, but also to his seed, that is, those who share in the faith of Abraham. If you go clear back or earlier in Galatians, uh, last week, in fact, in verses 7 through 9, do you remember what Paul wrote there? Galatians 3, 7 through 9 says, therefore, be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. The scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, all the nations will be blessed in you. So then, those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham the believer. Then in verse 14 of chapter 3, in order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. The point here is that the covenant with or the promises to Abraham didn't begin and end with him. Yes, God made that initial promise, that initial covenant or agreement with Abraham, but it was to have broader application. These promises continued because others were party to the covenant. Of course, the ultimate seed, and that's part of the point here in verse 16 as well, the ultimate seed or descendant of Abraham was Christ, the Messiah, the one through whom the blessings of the promise would be made available to all nations. You remember that was part of that initial covenant, right? God said back in Genesis in several places, as he, as he uh, dealt with Abraham, he says, in your, in, all nations will be blessed through you. And uh, that was a seed promise for, for all of that. So, yes, it says there in verse 16, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. All right, so the promises carried on even beyond Abraham's death. Verse 17, Paul says, What I am saying is this, the law which came 430 years later, does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. You know, he's been building toward this from verses 15 and 16. He uses the example of human covenants as, you know, once a human covenant has been ratified, no one comes along and nullifies or, or changes it. Well, Paul is making the point here with the promise and the law. The law doesn't invalidate or nullify the promise made to Abraham. As important as the law was in the plan of God, and by the way, Paul will get to that starting in verse 19 in just a little bit. The law was important in God's plan. It wasn't designed by God to replace or be in addition to that previous covenant with Abraham. That's what, in, here in verse 17, that's what I'm saying, Paul says. The law which came 430 years later does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. The law was, in a sense, you know, Johnny come lately in this process, but it's still part of God's plan. Verse 18. For if the inheritance is based on law, it is no longer based on a promise, but God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. So Paul once again here emphasizes that there is no compatibility between law and promise or faith. If you know the way to put that. The two systems of justification are mutually exclusive. 
We've been hitting at that all along. Paul has been talking about that. So uh, there's an incompatibility here. Again, they're both part of God's plan and used for different things. Look with me in Galatians 3. Let's back up a little bit again. And we're, again, our design is to keep things in context here. The best way to understand the Bible is to take a single verse and, and look at the verses around it. And remember what we saw in verses 10 through 12 of chapter 3. It says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. You see, that's what the law brings. The promise brings, you know, is, is that God's plan for justification by faith, the law, it says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law to perform them. Now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident. For the righteous man shall live by faith. However, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, he who practices them shall live by them. So again, Paul here is contrasting the law Versus the promise. Uh, the law isn't designed to justify. He speaks here in verse 18 of, of an inheritance. The inheritance, and we could just say that's the receiving of the blessings of Abraham that were promised to him and to his seed. The inheritance was based on the promises made to Abraham, not on his ability to keep the law. In Romans chapter 4, verses 13 and 14, Paul makes it abundantly clear. Romans 4, verses 13 and 14 says this, For the promise to Abraham and to his descendants that he would be heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith, or the promise. For though, if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void, and the promise is nullified. So there in Galatians or Romans, Paul is dealing much with what he's same thing he's talking about here. The law can't nullify the promise. And he's very clear here in Romans 4, verses 13 and 14. He's using inheritance language, right? He speaks of heirs here. An inheritance is something given, not earned. The example of Abraham illustrates that point. God's covenant promise with him wasn't based on any merit on his part, right? God graciously chose Abraham out of everyone at that particular time in history. God graciously chose him. And how did Abraham respond to God's call? By faith. He responded in faith. And of course, Christ, who is Abraham's ultimate seed, the one to whom that promise looked forward to, the one that would make it possible for Abraham's seed physical and spiritual, to share in that promise. It was Christ who made it possible for others to share in that inheritance through his death and resurrection. Hebrews 9 verse 15 says, For this reason he, or Jesus, in context in Hebrews, is the mediator of a new covenant, so that, since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, that's the old covenant, or law, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. So again, it takes Christ's death to reach back for that, to, to, for providing an inheritance, and it looks forward to anyone else by faith who shares in that eternal inheritance. All right, we'll shift gears a little bit here, starting in verse 19. And Paul is going to start highlighting, you know, he, in verses 15 through 18, he's highlighted that, you know, the law can't nullify or alter the promise made to Abraham. Now he's going to start talking about the real purpose of the law, God's standard of, of things. Verse 19, Galatians 3. Why the law then? It was added because of transgressions, having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. So Paul here, as I understand it, is anticipating another objection, right? After saying what he says about how the law can't come along and nullify the promise, can't alter the promise made to Abraham, 
It's as if Paul is thinking, well, someone's probably out there thinking, if what you're saying about justification by faith is true, then of what use is the law at all? Again, verse 19 starts this way. Why the law then? I like the way Barnes comments on this verse. Let me read a, a paragraph from him. Barnes says, this is, an ob this is obviously an objection which might be urged to the reasoning which the apostle has just pursued. It was very obvious to ask if the principles which he or Paul had laid down were correct, of what use then was the law? Why was it given at all? Why were there so many wonderful expo ex exhibitions of the divine power at its beginning? Why were there so many commendations of it in the scriptures? And why were there so many injunctions to obey it? See, those things are all true, aren't they? All, are all these to be regarded as nothing? And is the law to be esteemed as worthless? Why the law then? Just because the law is not tied to justification, and Paul is making that point strongly in chapters 3 and 4 here, but just because the law is not tied to justification, it wasn't designed to make anyone righteous, that doesn't mean that Paul in any way thinks the law is useless. As Paul says here in, in verse 19, the law was added because of transgressions. You see, the law, God giving the law to the Israelites, exposed human sinfulness, didn't it? It was not designed to save us, but to show us, or again, primarily the Israelites, to show that we cannot save ourselves. That's a big difference. The law highlights how desperately we need a Savior. The law wasn't our Savior. It didn't provide a means to be saved. But it just highlights how desperately we need to be saved. Romans 3, verses 19 and 20 says, For we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God, because by the works of the law no flesh will be justified in his sight, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Can't be any plainer, right? Paul says, by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. Again, law is in a system of justification. But through the law comes the knowledge of sin. That's part of God's design for it. Later in Romans chapter 5, verses 20 and 21, Paul again highlights the purpose for the law. He says, the law came in. Why? so that the transgression would increase. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. A little bit longer section from Romans 7, verses 7 through 13. Romans 7, verses 7 through 13. Again, Paul dealing there in Romans with the same kind of thing here. You know, people thinking, well, Paul's just throwing the law out. Paul thinks the law is useless. Uh, notice what he says here. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have known, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. For I would not known, I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. And this commandment, which was to result in life, proved to be death, result in death for me. For sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So then the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Therefore, that did that which is good become a cause of death for me? May it never be. Rather, it was sin, in order that it might be shown to be sin, by affecting my death through which, or through that which is good, so that through the commandment, sin would become utterly sinful. Again, the idea in you know, the law was designed by God, as it says here, it was added because of transgression. The law highlighted man's sinfulness, showed him his need for a savior. He also mentions here in this verse that the law was ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator. And of course, if you know your scriptures, you know this has reference to the giving of the law uh, after the escape from Egypt by God at Sinai. 
the giving of the law through Moses, and angels were involved in that as well. Stephen mentions in Acts chapter 7, verses 37 and 38, Stephen, before his martyrdom, is giving his defense, and he goes back to Old Testament history. He said, This is the Moses who said to the sons of Israel, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness together with the angel who was speaking to him on Mount Sinai and who was with our fathers and received living oracles to pass on to you. So Moses, if you will, is the mediator between God and man, and, and it was, there was an angel involved. Later in chapter 7 of Acts, verse 53, Stephen says, You who received the law as ordained by angels and yet did not keep it. And of course, at this point in, in uh, Stephen's defense, he's getting to the point where you know he's going to make them mad enough to start stoning him. Uh, he's, he's charging them with not keeping the law. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 2 again mentions angels associated with the giving of the law. Hebrews 2 verse 2 says, For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable, and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty. And in context, in Hebrews, that's referring uh, to the law. So on and on you've got this idea. The law, of course, Paul says, he's highlighting here in this context uh, even though the law wasn't to justify anyone, it, it had its purposes. It was added because of transgressions. It was ordained through the mediation of Moses and angels. He also mentions here in this verse that the law was to be until the seed would come. So while the law wasn't intended to justify, it was not unrelated to what God was endeavoring to accomplish through the covenant with Abraham and his seed. Again, God made the agreement, the covenant with Abraham, but it was looking way into the future for his, you know, the, uh, the uh, rescue of all mankind from sin. But it also, the law, had a limited scope of application. It was a temporary covenant. or uh, So that law, that old covenant was going to be a temporary thing. And we'll see more verses before we're done here that uh, emphasize that over and over again. In fact, right now in Hebrews chapter 7, verses 18 and 19, Hebrews is big, of course, in comparing the old covenant with the new and how the old was designed to pass away, giving way to the new. Hebrews 7, verses 18 and 19 says, For on the one hand, there is a setting aside of the former commandment, because of its weakness and usefulness for the law, notice what it says here, the law made nothing perfect, that's what we've been saying. And other, on the other hand, there is a bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. That's a contrast between old and new, law and, and grace in the new covenant. Hebrews 8, verse 8, For finding fault with them, he says, Behold, days are coming, says the Lord, when I, when I will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Of course, the Hebrew writer there in chapter 8, verse 8, is looking back to Jeremiah chapter 31. Uh, old covenant scriptures making the point God prophesied through Jeremiah that there would be a new covenant. The old covenant would give way to a new one. Then in verse 13 of chapter 8 of Hebrews, when he said a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete and whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. So that old covenant, the law, was designed to be a temporary thing in God's plan uh, that began, of course, with the promise to Abraham. Verse 20, Galatians chapter 3. Now a mediator is not for one party only, whereas God is only one. Now, this verse has troubled interpreters for centuries and spawned a wide variety of interpretation. And I don't know that I have, you know, the definitive answer on it or not. I, I, I struggled with this verse to, to fit it into the context. But, you know, it's always best, as we've said, to endeavor to understand it in context. So I'll give my take on it here and try to fit it into what Paul is reasoning here in these verses. In this section, of course, Paul has been discussing the relationship between the promise to Abraham and the law given, you know, four, some four centuries later after the promise. 
His point here in the immediate context is to show that God did have a purpose for the law, even if it wasn't to provide justification. Paul has been arguing here, right here, about, you know, the law. They, they were anticipating, he was anticipating, say, well, why the law then? Why bother? Well, Paul says there is a use. The law, as ordained by angels and mediated by Moses, played an intermediate and temporary role in revealing and restraining sinfulness until the coming of the Messiah, the seed of Abraham. That's emphasized here in the first part of this verse 20. Moses and the law interceded between God and sinful Israel, i.e. two parties. Now, a mediator is not for one party only. So you've got, again, the, you know, verse or two prior to this, he's been talking about Moses and the angels being intermediaries. Yet, the end of verse 20 says, God is one. The same God of the promise to Abraham is the God working through Mo Moses and the law at that stage of the working out of his plan. So while the law was temporary, it was still instituted by God and needed for his purposes. Now look at verse 21. Is the law then, Paul says, contrary to the promises of God? May it never be. For if a law had been given which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on law. So Paul here uses the strongest negative available in the Greek language to deny the idea that the law and the promise are at opposite purposes. Okay, now, law can't nullify or alter the promise, but that's not to say that the law and, and the promise are at opposite purposes in the plan of God. Paul says, may it, again, ask the question, anticipating it in the mind of his, his hearers or readers. He says, is the law then contrary to the promises of God? May it never be, or some of the older versions translated this, God forbid. Since God gave them both, God was the author of the, the promise to Abraham. God was also the author of the, the law. Since God gave them both and does not work against himself, law and promise work in harmony. He won't allow himself to be caricatured. Paul won't allow himself here to be caricatured as, as anti-law, right? You know, some were starting to suggest, well, Paul hates the law. Paul doesn't think the law is useless for or is useful for anything. No, throughout his other writings, we find Paul holding up the law for what it was intended. In fact, Romans chapter 7, verse 12 says, Paul says, So then the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. <laughs> How much clearer can Paul make it? But he's also been making the point here to pit the law against the promise is the wrong thing to do. Now they they don't try to God isn't trying to accomplish the same things through them, but you're not also to pit the law against the promise. Remember, law isn't designed to give life; it can only condemn. We've seen that already. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 16 says, Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. So again, don't pit the law against the promise. Uh, the law wasn't designed to give life. Paul has been making that clear throughout the book of Galatians, chapter 3, verse 10. Remember, Paul said, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law. Law brings a curse. That was part of the design of all of that. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 4 is also pertinent here as we discuss chapter 3, verse 21 of Galatians. Romans 8, verses 1 through 4, Paul says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did 
sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So again, Paul strongly says here, again, the law isn't contrary to the promises of God, but they're not designed to do the same thing. Verse 22 of Galatians 3, Paul says, But the scripture has shut up everyone under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Paul here has been using Old Covenant writings throughout this entire section to make his case. Book, chapter, and verse. The reference here in context would be to the writings concerning the law. When it says, but the scripture has shut up everyone under sin. He's been talking about the law doing that up to this point, but it is part of scripture. As we have seen, it is the law that reveals all to be sinners. But even that negative situation is being used by God to keep his promise to Abraham. The highlighting of sinfulness reveals the even greater glory of the blessing available to believers through the faithfulness of Christ, the ultimate seed of Abraham. Through putting our faith in Christ, we also, even at this distance from Abraham, can access the blessings promised to him. Verse 23, but before the faith came, or before faith came rather, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. Faith here in verse 23, I think, is looking ahead and speaking of the coming of Christ and the new covenant system of faithfulness he initiated. It can't be saying uh, faith didn't exist until after the law. That doesn't make any sense because he's already here in Galatians used Abraham as what? An example of one justified by faith long before the law. So faith can't be meaning uh, faith as a system. Faith here again, I think, is speaking of the coming of Christ. When it says, until faith came, well, who came? Jesus did. He brought through his death, burial, and resurrection the beginning of the new covenant. As has been said before, the law was a temporary custodian of sinners until the time of Christ in the new covenant. It is not contrary to the promise. That's what verse 21 said. It serves the purposes of the promise. Verse 24, therefore... The law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. Probably a better translation here would be like the NIV or the ESV when it says guardian. Uh, the new Revised Standard Version uses the word disciplinarian. Uh, the old RSV uses the very word custodian. Uh, those are probably better terms because when we think of a in English, at least, of a tutor, we think of someone, you know, instructing. And while this particular person in in the time of Jesus probably did some instructing, it was more used in the sense of a guardian, a, a caretaker. Uh, and he points out here, uh, it says, Therefore the law has become our tutor or guardian or custodian to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. The NIV Cultural Background Study Bible uh, regarding this particular word, it says the Greek term here refers not to a teacher, but to a slave assigned to watch out for the student on his way to school and to help him with his manners and schoolwork. The image is not a negative one per se. Children often grew fond of their slave guardians and later freed them. So again, uh, this tutor, or dis uh, disciplinarian, guardian, custodian, whichever word you like to use here, was a, a temporary position until the child grew to the point where uh, they could handle affairs on their own. And Paul's making the point here by example. He says the law is fulfilled that role in God's plan to lead the world to Christ. The law was pointing to one beyond itself, to Christ, the one who could truly justify by faith. Finally, verse 25, Paul says, But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor, or guardian, or custodian, or schoolmaster. That's another probably misunderstood term. But once again here, Paul is highlighting the temporary nature of the law. Temporary. The guardian of a child was only needed 
for a time, wasn't he? Until the child grew to maturity, the coming of Christ and the new covenant of faith that he instituted marked the time when the guardian, or the law here in this instance, had fulfilled his task. So hopefully this has helped us as, as we've worked our way through chapter 3. We've got a little bit more to cover, but it fits in perhaps a little bit better with what comes a little bit later in chapter 4. So we'll start again next time here in chapter 3, verse 26. Paul has a whole lot more to say in this discussion of justification by faith, and we'll uh, track through that part of the argument, Lord willing, next time when we get together. Thank you for uh, studying along with me, and I pray this has been of, of some benefit.